The following podcast is part of our Best of Invisible Wheelchair podcast for 2017. It was previously broadcast this past year and is being rebroadcast here. Welcome to another edition of the Invisible Wheelchair Interview Podcast. I'm Donald Grodoff, family coach with FamilyOCD.com, FocusedHealthyFamily.com, and of course, InvisibleWheelchair.com. In the Invisible Wheelchair interviews, I get the wonderful chance to interview some of the experts with obsessive compulsive disorders, professionals that treat OCD, people who are going through or have been through OCD, parents and caregivers of those suffering from OCD, and of course, anyone that advocates for treatment of OCD. My goal of these interviews is to inform people on all aspects of OCD and bring about awareness of obsessive compulsive disorder. Please remember that I am not a doctor, therapist, or counselor, and the content, information, resources, and ideas that are talked about and brought up here in these interviews are not necessarily the views and opinions of myself, Family OCD, Focused Healthy Family, and Invisible Wheelchair Podcast, and I always recommend to seek additional professional help in finding solutions for yourself. You can find out more about me at FamilyOCD.com, FocusedHealthyFamily.com, and InvisibleWheelchair.com. This podcast interview was recorded on September 1st, 2017. This podcast is a very special podcast for me for a couple of reasons. First off, it's going to be one of the podcasts that I do for the week of October 8th through the 14th, 2017 for OCD Week. And it's also special for me because I hold a special place in my heart for uh, this gentleman who is one of what I would consider one of the experts of OCD here in Charlotte and probably goes beyond that because I know he's well known throughout the industry or the the uh, field of OCD. And his name is Dr. Kevin Jericho. And Dr. Jericho is a licensed psychologist whose passion is helping adults and children overcome anxiety and OCD related disorders. Dr. Jericho provides state-of-the-art cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, through his practice, the Anxiety and OCD Treatment Centers, located here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Dr. Jericho has extensive experience working with children, adolescents, and adults suffering from anxiety and OCD-related disorders. An expert in cognitive behavioral therapy, Dr. Jericho is certified by the Academy of Cognitive Therapy. In addition to his full-time private practice in Charlotte, Dr. Jericho enjoys presenting at national conferences and other audiences on treatment of anxiety and OCD. And again, I'm so happy to have him here today to be able to talk to us because he can really go into what OCD is about, because he's worked in it for a long time. So let's get to that interview. Well, good morning, Dr. Jericho, and welcome to the Invisible Wheelchair, and I really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you, Donald. Thank you for having me. Uh, I look forward to talking with you today about OCD and treatment, all that sort, all those kind of things. What I'd like to start with, uh, Dr. Jericho, is what inspired you to go down the OCD path? Well, that, that's a great question. I, I think my, uh, my path was probably similar to many other psychologists. When you're first considering a career in psychology, it's kind of a broad field uh, with many different options to choose from. Most of the training programs that you go into try to expose you to a lot of different aspects of psychology, similar to medical students having to do all different kinds of rotations. And then as people go along, they tend to choose what areas they like to specialize in. And one of the, the main things that 
drew me to OCD was how effective the treatment was. Um, it seemed like incredibly rewarding to me to be able to work with this type of therapy called exposure and response prevention and see tremendous progress in people who are suffering greatly. Uh, severe OCD can really bring intense suffering to people and uh, effective treatment can often alleviate that suffering quite quickly. So that was, that was very appealing to me on that aspect of things. And also the variety. OCD has an endless, can present itself in endless different ways. Uh, and so that appealed to me as well as the, the ongoing learning and practice it requires to continue to improve on my end. I've been at this for 17 years now, and I still feel like I'm learning every day, which is, which kind of keeps me on my toes and keeps things fresh and interesting for me. So really those factors that drew me into treating anxiety and OCD-related problems. Oh, that, that's wonderful. That, that's a... That's a great cause. Since you, met, you mentioned ERP, what I'd like to ask you, I, I've done a podcast on ERP, and I, I've been through it. In fact, I've been through it twice now, so I know the process, but I'd like to get your uh, slant on it, what, how you explain uh, exposure response prevention, ERP therapy. You know, first of all, I'd say ERP is often a scary concept to people who are suffering from OCD at first, and, and uh once they kind of see what's entailed, oftentimes that fear goes down. If you think about any fear or anxiety that we might have, intuitively, you know, we sort of know that um, to overcome fear, we have to face it, that, that we sort of, you know, even if you ask a five-year-old or a six-year-old, they'll, they'll be able to kind of tell you that. So it's sort of an intuitive thing to realize, hey, the more I avoid something, uh, the, the stronger my fear will get, and then as I approach something, my fear will actually go down. And so that's kind of the exposure aspect of things, the E in ERP, this concept of approaching versus avoidance of things that we're afraid of. Uh, and that's true of all anxiety beyond just OCD, all fears and phobias. And then the RP comes into play, the response prevention comes into play with the idea that if we're going to expose ourselves to the things that we fear to reduce our anxiety, we can't do that and simultaneously do any behaviors to try to make ourselves feel better in those moments because that will nullify or defeat the purpose of exposure. So when we do treating OCD, we're trying to combine those two ideas in that we're confronting our fears but we're that we're gradually confronting our fears but we're also doing it in a, in a way where we're, we're not allowing ourselves to give in to any any compulsions or any safety behaviors in those situations it's a little bit like diet and exercise you know if you go out and, it's great if you go out and run six miles or something like that but then if you come back home and eat uh, a big chocolate cake it's probably going <laughs> to kind of defeat all the hard work that you just did. Yeah. And that's that's true of exposure and response prevention. If we go out and expose ourselves, and in the midst of that or during or after we do a bunch of uh, C, compulsions in OCD, that, then it usually we usually don't find much benefit from that in the long run. So we have to sort of put those two pieces together. And if we do that for any fear, we'll actually see uh, the anxiety about that reduce, not just OCD, but but other anxieties as well. So in doing the ERP and doing the work you do, uh, where do you, what's the biggest challenges that you face? Yeah, in my opinion, the, the biggest challenge that we face is helping people overcome the fear of exposure response prevention. That there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. And, you know, oftentimes when I mention it in one of my first meetings with somebody, they'll get this big look in their eyes and, <laughs> Uh, say, oh, I've heard about that. That sounds terrible. And then they'll oftentimes say, you're not going to make me, uh, you know, jump off a bridge or something, are you? You know, <laughs> something. And, and so, so there's a lot of myths about exposure and response prevention therapy, I think, that unfortunately may steer people away from it at times. Um, and so that's one of the biggest challenges we face is helping people not to be afraid of doing exposure therapy work and, and to understand that exposure therapy 
typically does not involve doing anything extreme or outrageous. One rule of thumb that we use is that if we won't do it, we'll never ask somebody else to do it. I'm not uh. going to go jump off a bridge, so <laughs> I'm certainly not going to ask anybody else to do that. Um, yeah. And so, so, you know, oftentimes we can get great progress with, uh, you know, exposures that are, would be just part of everyday life, that they, they would not be anything uh, outside of um, sort of, you know, normal existence, so to speak. There are horror stories of outrageous exposures that uh, do happen at times, but uh, that's not typically part of treatment. Would you say that that challenge, that's the challenge that you and the people you work with face? Would you say that's the, the biggest challenge for the, the person with OCD also? Yeah, yes, I would agree with that. I think that their biggest challenge, too, is, is overcoming that sort of fear of starting exposure and doing exposure. And then typically, once people get over the hump on that concern, they usually just you know, roll and make good, solid progress. But if they have any initial concerns, uh, I would say that's the biggest challenge. And you know, the second biggest challenge I think people face is you know, the, the anxiety that is produced by exposure. Exposure doesn't work if it doesn't produce any anxiety. And so, so we have to produce some, but not a ton. Uh, and, and so kind of managing that and coping with that and allowing that to be there. And So with that thought in mind, and something just came to my mind to ask you about the idea of compensations. I, I, that was one of the biggest things that I learned personally, and my wife and I learned, my daughter, is that we had to control the compensations that we were making for her. Uh, would you agree with that? And, and is that, do you think that's part of uh, the work you have to do? So when, when you say compensations, are you referring to other people helping? Uh, well, no, what, what I look at as compensation is, for instance, with my daughter, she at one point was stuck on the couch. We were bringing her mm -hmm. a box full of spoon, plastic spoons or forks. She would take one out and use it and throw it away instead of, instead of using a regular silverware and coming to the table. So we were compensating by giving her that. We were basically, I think, to me, compensation is feeding OCD. And that, that's the way I looked at compensation. So I, and I talk about that. I did a podcast on it because I, I to me that seemed very important. What we had to do eventually is to slowly back off those compensations and draw her back to doing the things that regular people do. Right. Yeah, no, that's 100% true. And it, it, you bring up a great point when we're talking about compulsions or sometimes we just call them safety behaviors. Uh, it doesn't really matter who is doing it person who has OCD is doing it uh, or somebody else is doing it for them still, you know, considered uh, a compulsion and there, therefore would be a target for response prevention. Oh, that's, that's, I never thought about it as just being another type of compulsion. That, that's great. I, that gives me a new definition on that. Thank you. Yeah. The other thing, I, you know, we did, re my wife and I did research on and we found out about is pa what they call pandas and pans. And I'm curious as to how you would define that and what the difference is between, say, pandas and, say, I'm going to call it just regular OCD, whether that's a way to describe it or not, I don't think is right. But So what, what, is, the, what is pandas and pans, and where would you see the difference in it? How would you um, treat it differently? Well, that, that's a great question, um, and I do think you, you know, a, a fair way to think about it would be hands and then regular old OCD. You know, this is my 17th year in, in practice, and I've watched PANS uh, go from being something that, you know, most people didn't believe in, particularly uh, physicians, to becoming more mainstream, to becoming something that, you know, more and more people talk about. You know, 17 years ago, if you mentioned PANS, they, they sort of looked at you like you were crazy. You know, I, I can give you my perspective and you know, there's research bearing this out as they study it more and more. You know, I think there's, in, in my career, I've, I, I've seen a, a distinct difference between PANS OCD and regular OCD. So, there are actually several distinct differences with PANS OCD. Uh, well, first of all, let's say what PANS is. Um, PANS is a, a, a neurological disorder brought about by uh, an infection that creates an autoimmune response in the brain that triggers uh, OCD-like symptoms. 
initially the um, the view is that it was primarily a strep infection that would trigger this, and that's still the case, but uh, now there's evidence that other types of infections, such as Lyme, Lyme disease or even uh, H1N1 or, or those kind of things, can also trigger an autoimmune reaction that creates um, these symptoms. And essentially what you see is a very sudden, uh, literally kind of overnight uh, onset of very severe OCD symptoms. Uh, most parents, when I talk with them, they, they can name the day, even if it was five years ago, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the symptoms started. They can, you know, I'll hear, you know, on July 10th, uh, 2009 was, was when the world kind of fell apart. And then it, with PANS, you also see uh, other symptoms uh, such as difficulty managing emotions, more temper tantrums, separation anxiety, uh, neurological symptoms such as um, decline in handwriting or uh, forgetting of things that have been previously been learned or short-term memory loss, you know, those kind of things. Things that, uh, and you don't always see those, um, but, you, but they tend to have, there tend to be some neurological symptoms at times um, that aren't typically present in uh, plain old OCD, as you said, uh, which is which is uh, what I call it too. And so there's there's a kind of distinctive difference where uh, with regular OCD, you see typically a much more gradual onset over time, and you don't typically have uh, the comorbid things that you see in PANS, whereas PANS you see a you know much more sudden onset typically, and then one or more <clears throat> excuse me other physical sin symptoms or neurological symptoms are typically absent in regular OCD. Wow, that uh, when you speak like that, it brings up old memories because that's exactly what we went through. I, I don't know if I knew the exact date, but I, could, I can remember the exact day that that light switch went off for us. And it was, um, <laughs> and, it, and it definitely like started ripping our life apart. Um, so I, I can feel that very much when you say that. Yeah. It, it, it does bring up uh, one, uh, I think, one last question. And, and are there other types or definitions for, of OCD, uh, different uh, categories, I guess, of OCD other than the PANS and PANDA? You know, it's really the, the PANS. PANDAs one, it's called PANS now. It used to be called PANDAs and then regular OCD. And then there's also what are called OC spectrum disorders are, are things like eating disorders and, and, and things like that that have similar features to OCD, but they're not quite OCD, uh, body dysmorphic disorder, those kind of things. And, and that's pretty much the grouping of OCD-related disorders at this point. It kind of divides into those three things, regular OCD PANS and then OC spectrum disorders. And are tics part of that too? Tics are, are be put in, uh, in the OC spectrum okay. typically, yes. It's like a tic disorder, Tourette's. Um, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, they, they typically are lumped into that group. And I just actually heard about um, misophonia. Have you, mm -hmm. have you, are you, in audio, an audio one that classifies very closely to OCD is what I understand. I just started learning about this just recently. Is, is that correct? Or do you, have you heard of that? That is correct. Yeah, we've heard of that uh, quite often here, and, and that is something also that would be kind of lumped into that uh, OC spectrum group at times. Well, Dr. Jericho, I mean, I, I probably could talk on this <laughs> all day because it just it's been such a big part of my life, and, and it's a big part of what I do in my in my practice. So, I, I so much appreciate this. I, I would I would give you some some time now to. Uh, tell our audience as to what's the best way for them if if they suspect this in their life. One is how they can get a hold of you, and and what are some of the first things that they could do uh, that would be, you know, most beneficial for them. Well, th thank you, Donald, for having me. Uh, and I certainly could talk with you about this subject all day as well. Um, and it, you know, uh, my my practice, the phone number is. 704-631-3980, and our website is anxietyandocdtreatmentcenter.com. You know, that you certainly, if, if you're seeking help, you can certainly reach out. Another great resource is the International OCD Foundation, uh, which is um, uh, IOCDF 
OCD.org. If you want to see their website, they have a ton of great information about OCD uh, on the site, and uh, it's a great way to learn more about the disorder and treatments available. Well, thank you for sharing that, and uh, all of that will be on the InvisibleWheelchair.com site to uh, Dr. Jericho's information, the phone number, and everything is there uh, for reference. Also on my family OCD site, familyocd.com, you'll have that information. Uh, and Dr. Jericho, once again, I just want to thank you. The, the, it's been enlightening what you've told me. I know you do such good work. Your, your name is out there in such a good way. You're kind of known, I think, out in, the, in at least in the local area as the local OCD expert, but I think it spreads further than that. I'm sure you do work all over the, all over the country probably, maybe even over the world. And uh, I really admire your work, and I, again, appreciate you being here. Well, thank you for having me. It was a true pleasure, uh, and I look forward to collaborating in the future. And uh, we'll talk soon. This concludes this podcast. Please remember to leave comments for me because that really helps me to understand what you're looking for and helps give me fodder for the next possible podcast. Also, I'd love to hear your Invisible Wheelchair story if you're willing to share it. If you are, feel free to go to InvisibleWheelchair.com and click on Tell Your Story. Now, if you've heard these things and you feel like you need further assistance or some help in what you're going through, and you want to spend some time with me working through those issues, then feel free to book a session at FocusedHealthyFamily.com or FamilyOCD.com or simply call me at 704-562-1630. Finally, don't forget there is a tapping recording following this podcast you may want to take advantage of. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast and will join me for the next one. Remember, keep tapping, talking, and transcending your life. Thank you. Have a great day.